So the next domain that we're going to be jumping into is the software development security. So earlier on the week, I had mentioned uh, a few things um, that typically in the business, we see a, a fairly big divide or a great divide between uh, network engineers and software engineers. Um, and I say that because usually at a point in your career, you figure out what really cranks your tractor, what gets you going, you know, what what you like to do, what you don't like to do. And um, at some point, in my opinion, at least, um, it isn't always about how much money you're making. It's more about uh, whether or not you enjoy what you're doing. And so what we find is that at some point, software engineers figure out that they don't necessarily want to do networking engineering or network engineering. And network engineers figure out at some point they don't want to um, do software engineering or build software. And because of that, uh, usually security professionals or the some of the best security professionals that I know all over the world usually can identify that there is that they have a weakness in in an area or they don't prefer to do work in a particular area but they understand it enough that if need be they could absolutely jump in and uh, get dirty if they need to so i say that because this software development security a lot of people um don't want to code a lot of people don't want to script or have never taken the time to learn how to do it. And that's okay, that's that's totally okay. Um, but if you do, then it adds another uh, tool to your utility belt, that Batman utility belt or Batwoman utility belt that you have, um, it just gives you another, another tool in your arsenal. And for me, I think it, it's super important. What, to me are some of the best network defenders that I've met, some of the best engineers that I've met, understand networking, absolutely can do networking, understand software, absolutely can do software, but kind of coalesce somewhere in the middle and uh, you know, teeter back and forth, can do networking, can do software, but you know, security and secure operations, secure software engineering, uh secure systems engineering uh secure network engineering those are things that i think a lot of people really really enjoy so what we're going to jump into uh is the software development security and usually usually we look at the software development security domain and think about what is software engineering and uh, I think at a, a holistic approach, um, most of the time when you jump right into this domain and, and it's explicitly from the uh, Sean Harris book, uh, the typical piece of software is built around functionality. And I totally agree with that. Usually it, when we, when my team goes through and starts to talk about, you know, how we want to uh, put something together, uh, you know, I always think about in my in my head how how's it going to look, uh, but in a, a little bit more granular sense, what's going to be the functionality? What is it going to actually do? What's the software that I'm writing going to actually do? And um, like I said before, with the the development life cycle, a lot of times functionality is the first thing that you think about. And security is an afterthought. So people tend to bolt on security later on down the road. And, uh, you know, usually it's best practice that you see to implement it uh, further to the left of the project. So as we jump in here, that's what we're trying to do. I think that's really what things like frameworks like the risk management framework tries to uh, force engineers to not only document what they're doing, uh, but also uh, 
practice security and move it to the left of the life cycle. And because of that, um, you know, we, we can apply the practice of secure principles to software development. And in this particular domain, we want to just leave here today, hopefully, with a good idea of some common vernacular, understand what development is in software development, and understand what role security plays in the software world. So as we go through, if there's any questions, feel free to um, hit me up in, in uh, the audio or um, in a chat, and I'll be more than happy to try to answer those questions. So when you take a look at a lot of the, the software that's, that's built, and I, I tend to lean towards, uh, at least in this paradigm or this example, I tend to lean towards um, Microsoft. And uh, ever since I've gotten into the business, it's kind of a, a running joke about uh, patch Tuesdays being, you know, a day that Microsoft puts out patches. And so, you know, if you, if you think about this right here, uh, and this, this cyclic approach that typically will happen, usually, usually we see these trends. So check it out. Buggy software is released to try to beat the competition to market. And I totally agree with that. Then when you release it, and it's exposed and uh, people come out the woodwork, especially if you put it on the public internet, uh, hackers will find it and then they will try to exploit it and any vulnerabilities or weaknesses to that software you built. So if you have bugs, there's a good chance that it's gonna end up uh, being found and then there's gonna be some, uh, some weaknesses to it. Then what they typically will do, the attackers, is they will uh, post those vulnerabilities to websites that other attackers will go to and screenshots on how they were able to exploit them. And then not only did you have one problem with one attacker, uh, now that they've posted it out there, now you got all sorts of people coming out the woodwork um, because it's been published on a hacking website now. And you know, once you do become aware of it, then um, you'll start to develop and release a patch to fix those issues, those holes that are in, those, in those. And then, like I said earlier, the new patch goes on the stack and the administrators need to test and install it. So, you know, in the DOD sense, something like this could be the, the IAVM process right here. Uh, but certainly, you know, if you think about Microsoft and some of the Patch Tuesdays that they have, um, I would I would say that uh, this is a good example of that as well. So usually, usually, between the time that a zero day is found, so a zero day is the uh, the day that a vulnerability is exposed to the market and made aware. So this is the first day, it's called a zero day, that a hacker will find a new vulnerability. And you know, if they're a white hat, what they would do is they would tell the company that they found it, hey, I'm, you know, before I release this out as a white paper on how I was able to exploit your system, I wanna give you a chance to to go in and patch it, I'm gonna give you, uh, this is how I was able to do it. And uh, so they, they find a zero day. What EC Council has done is they've done a bunch of research on this. And again, this is the, the EC Council is uh, the creator of the CEH Certified Ethical Hacker Certification. Uh, they say the average zero day goes undetected for 72 days on average, 72 days. And at 72 days, the zero day is, is found. And usually the vendor will then try to develop that patch for however long that takes. It could be upward of you know, 30, 60, 90 days. But if you take that 72 days 
and then add to it the time that it takes the vendor to develop the patch and fix the vulnerability, at least, let's just say, at least 30 days here, we're looking at three months and change right here, 102 days. So what were you doing 102 days ago whenever a zero day was found and it hasn't been, a patch has not been released to fix that issue? Somebody had mentioned earlier about uh, the older population that are using computing devices. Um, and one of the things that before Windows 10, we saw with Windows is that you could kick the can down the road with the patches and just keep saying, nope, I don't want to update right now. I don't want to update. I don't want to update. Don't want to update. And what what Microsoft was finding is that sometimes people would would go six, eight, you know, 10, 12 months where they would not patch their, their operating systems, leaving gaping holes in there for attackers to uh, exploit those those issues on their systems that are connected to the internet. And uh, so with Windows 10, Windows just, or Microsoft just came out and said, you know what, we're just gonna update it and uh, we'll ask for forgiveness. And you know, you can go off and disable that, but most people don't know you can do that. But uh, that is really their mitigation is to force those updates on you to try to practice good security. And this is typically what we, we see to the point where now it becomes a cycle. And uh, you know, once the new patch is released, what's the next one in the hopper? What's the next one's in the hopper? You know, the good news is, is for whatever the software company is right here, whatever software company built the software, people are using it. So that means you're probably making money off it, but how much is the reputation worth uh, to get egg in your face if there is a, a massive issue with the software. So building good code and uh, making sure it's secure really tightly couples software release cycles and any security considerations that you have. So in this domain, uh, we, we talk about the a, a bunch of different life cycles in, in this domain. And, uh, you know, I've been involved with uh, with a few of them over time. And usually what we see, it doesn't really matter what the life cycle is, usually what we see is that there typically is a, a very uh, rigorous process for how we develop software. And usually that software development life cycle, or SDLC, is uh, very important. It doesn't matter where you go. A lot of times you're going to start off with a requirements gathering session or numerous sessions to get the requirements. Then you'll come up with a design. You'll jump into the development of the project. Then you throw it over the fence to somebody else and let them test it or validate that it actually is meeting what we need. And then we'll jump into actually how are we going to release it and uh, get into an operation and maintenance mode with, uh, you know, like we showed in the last slide, uh, constantly trying to update things to make sure that uh, it adheres to all the different phase, phases of the life cycle. So in most cases, what we see is that uh, all of this equals the a fairly significant project to the point where uh, you know project management really comes into play here. So using things like various development technologies, uh, you, you may have heard of DevOps before. One key thing that you absolutely will see on your exam is change control and change management. How is that done? How do we make sure that you know things are getting built properly, things are getting implemented properly, and uh, the like. So uh, we're going to go through and talk about some of these concepts. And if they're unfamiliar to you, maybe we'll, uh, we'll or not maybe, but we will definitely try to see if we can, you know, break them down a little bit further and uh, put them in the layman's terms. So uh, if there's any questions, please feel free to, to, to stop. 
and I'll be more than happy to try to, to answer anything that I can. Uh, so with some of these different software development methods, um, it depends on really where you go and who you're working with. Um, you know, for, for us and a lot of the customers that we work with, um, you know, usually we try to deliver on a weekly basis, tangible things on a weekly basis. So uh, something using something like the, uh, the scrum process or uh, rapid prototyping or uh, rapid development, you know, where we have, uh, you know, two people working in tandem to try to solve a problem together. Um, those are things that, that I've seen over my career that work very, very well. But, you know, a lot of larger projects like to use something called a waterfall method. So if you've never seen a waterfall method before, usually this is kind of what it looks like. And uh, for software, you come up with the idea for the software and you do some sort of feasibility analysis on it. And from that, the feasibility phase must be complete before we jump into the analysis phase. So feasibility gets complete, we'll jump into analysis. Analysis must be complete before we get into design. Design must be complete before we get into implementation. Implementation must be complete before we get into test. And then tests must be uh, complete before we get into maintenance mode. And then it kind of just goes back to the drawing board uh, in more of a cyclic approach. And this is, um, uh, I, I think, more uh, of a formal process. And in my experience, when we have done, um, or we have supported contracts that adhere to a waterfall method, usually you see the 30, 60, it's supposed to be 60, 60, 90 approach, 30, 60, 90 approach, where usually they try to meet and deliver things um, 30 days out, 60 days out, 90 days out. Usually that's what I see in my experience for waterfall methods. Uh, and again, each phase must be completed in its entirety before the next phase can begin. Uh, this is something that a lot of the massive government contractors still use, the waterfall method. And in my opinion, um, uh, there are tremendous inefficiencies with this model for, for any government people that are online, not being able to um, have or talk or show any tangible things to the customer for 30, 60 or 90 days out, that's too long. So that's why I say usually what we do is we will lead to more of a, a scrum methodology or uh, where we we're constantly in contact maybe every day with the development team and every day or every other day with the customer to figure out what did we do yesterday? What are we doing today? And do we have any obstacles? So typically that's what that's the way that we practice uh, developing uh, for uh, customers that, that we have. Uh, so the, the interesting thing is, is that if you've never built a prototype, um, for anything in your life, then you're really missing out. And it doesn't necessarily have to be software, but you know, think about that time that you may have had an idea and that idea, um, you know, maybe you did a cursory look at, at on uh, Dr. Google and you didn't see anything that was out there for that. You know, taking that concept that's in your head and being able to draw it down on a napkin or, you know, take that, uh, that vision that you have in, in your head and put it down on paper, um, maybe get some 
colored pencils out and, and make it look really um, professional looking or uh, take that idea that was on that napkin, put it into PowerPoint and do a mock-up or a, um, you know, just a draft of what you feel like um, might be a solution. I think to me, that's something that is super awesome is being able to uh, build things and have the usability meet the design and the vision that you had is one of the main reasons why I love to, to build software personally. And to have that ability to crank something out very quickly and take it to a customer and potentially get a customer to fund something um, really is, is, is kind of neat. And uh, some of the problems do rise with um, rapid application development and uh, rapid prototyping. Sometimes you hear people say, however, uh, because it's done so quickly, that it is quick and dirty. So I'm gonna put quotes around that because uh, usually if something takes really, really short amount of time um, and you thought that it was a massive problem, then there's probably gonna be some issues with it down the road. So uh, a quick and dirty solution. Uh, sometimes, you know, with some of these prototypes, they are um, kept together with bubble gum and duct tape. And I say that because, um, you know, if they're, especially in software, the, the development team will more than likely know which bus buttons are hard coded, which buttons are there to just for uh, aesthetic purposes and that you're not supposed to click on. Um, so they say that it's really held together by bubble gum and duct tape. So if you take some of this terminology that we're reviewing right now or that we're, we're covering right now and you think about some of the different concepts that we uh, talked about earlier on in the week, one reigns supreme, especially when you're doing um, rapid development or software development in any phase, is which enterprise assurance level is the software at? So how much have you invested into it in the, the documentation, the, the testing? Um, have you done that internally? Have you had a non-interested third party come and test it? Uh, and if so, then it kind of goes up the food chain for the different EAL levels for the common criteria. And so it's tightly coupled to that. And a lot of times you'll hear people talk about that um, hand in hand. What's the EAL level? Uh, do you practice the, uh, the common criteria? So keep that in mind uh, because a lot of times with any of these, we want to make sure we answer one question when we're developing software. And that is, is this what you want? And if the customer comes back and says yes, then everything's pieces and cream, but uh, if they come back and say, no, nope, that sucks. You didn't even come anywhere close to what I was thinking. Um, then you did not have a meeting of the minds and you were not able to uh, get that customer what they want. And hopefully that makes sense. So there's a bunch of different types of software development methods. Uh, and we, we covered a few of them here um, in this lecture. So I want to hold off before I talk about the capability maturity model. And I want to talk about this right here real quick. So a fairly newer term that we've been seeing uh, in the market is uh, 
not necessarily DevOps, but security DevOps or Sec DevOps. And um, this is, if you look at this Venn diagram here, the the DevOps or development operations really is a uh, a type of uh, practice where you bring together or incorporate the development IT and the quality assurance staff into the software development projects. And hopefully you align each components incentives to enable frequent, efficient, and reliable releases of the software. So in addition to this right here, what we have started to see is not just IT operations here, but this IT operations is what we're starting to see is that this function is beginning to look more like a security operations. That's supposed to be an S. Uh, so if this is security right here, now we have the security engineers come and put their smack down on you know, the software engineers and the quality engineers. And the security folks are usually uh, pretty savvy with IT operations out the get go anyway. So we now have this coalescence from just regular DevOps to now Sec DevOps. And this is a, a newer term that uh, the Sec DevOps is something that we're seeing more and more frequent to have the software development team talk with security team or the IT team, as well as the uh, quality assurance, because usually, um, you know, especially for, for these folks here, the software engineers, sometimes, and we have, we have some folks like this that, that work for me, uh, where, you know, they're, uh, how do I say it nicely, um, socially awkward, and they uh, are more introverted, so really you give them an assignment, they co go off into their, their dark cave where all you have to do is slide pizza under the door and you know they start to crank out code and then they come back in a week and it's done or they think it's done. And you know, you're trying with DevOps and Sec DevOps, you're trying to uh, assist those types of uh, rabbit holes from happening and you force people on your team to be a forced extrovert for at least 10 or 15 minutes a day to make sure that you have ongoing discussions each and every day and integrate security into the quality assurance the software engineering any IT infrastructure or cloud technology behind the scenes. So that's where this, uh, uh, the SEC DevOps and DevOps comes into play. Usually the, the different teams don't ever talk to each other. And so this kind of forces that to happen by uh, allowing good collaboration. And this is one of the key things. Like if you see some of these, these tech giants out there that uh, have these cool setups or these slick looking offices, it really fosters collaboration by having an open space. And that's one of the reasons why, if you look at some of the like Google and Facebook, Twitter, Dropbox, and you know, some of these big software shops out there that have uh, decent products, they um, have these open spaces to try to avoid isolation and you know that that person, that metaphor that I was talking about just a couple seconds ago, of uh, you know somebody going into a dark cave or a dark room and you slide in pizza under the door. Well, instead now you know they have the glass walls, um, you know, no doors, you know, open kind of really bright whites, bright oranges, uh, like different different pastel colors to to kind of get the 
the creative juice is flowing, I guess. Uh, and that's really what you're trying to do with the, the DevOps is to, to uh, force collaboration. And um, I think that it really does foster creativity and innovation and allows the people that may not be software engineers to lift up the hood a little bit to, to uh, ask questions, uh, not in a, in a berating way or, you know, you're cutting down somebody, but more of a curiosity way. And uh, those curious questions can lead to new innovation and creativity, which is kind of neat. So we're seeing that uh, in the market in a lot of uh, different offerings. People are wanting to do more and more DevOps. And in our profession, sec DevOps. All right, so this next topic here is the CMMI. And uh, we, we've talked about this a little uh, already throughout the week, but uh, the definition is a comprehensive integrated set of guidelines for developing products and software. So you integrate this into the SDLC, the software development lifecycle. And um, by doing that, it adds a way that we can practice the different processes that we have to see how we can make them more efficient and improve on those processes. Um, this is really tries to thwart any of a quote unquote fly by the seat of your pants attitude whenever you're developing. And uh, it adds value and efficiency, uh, best practices with the organization. And um, is meaningful. I will tell you that it also costs a lot of money to implement. So with this, we have these different levels here. There's five levels, and it's very likely you will see one question on your exam about the CMMI um, maturity levels and the uh, efficiencies of those. So with the level one here, the initial, we develop processes and we try to um, hopefully get some sort of consistency um, but from our existing unpredictable, poorly controlled and reactive. Uh, really, this is the starting point of most organizations is the uh, level one, it's unpredictable, poorly controlled, it's reactive. And uh, what you try to do is you try to, you know, get to a place where now we can start to reuse code or we can reuse processes and not reinvent the wheel every time, not reinvent the wheel every time. And, you know, even for our development team, that's one of the things that we continually try to improve is to try to not reinvent the wheel every time. Do we have existing uh, code bases that we have written already that we can reutilize and basically repeat and reuse as much as possible? Uh, from there, then you get to what um, most companies that implement CMMI um, achieve. They get usually a uh, a level three where they have defined processes and it's considered proactive. So those formal procedures are put in place and they outline and define different processes to carry out each project. Um, usually you can do quantitative process improvement based off of metrics that, you know, how long it took you to do certain things, uh, whether that's software, um, IT, security, or quality assurance, testing, you can come up with metrics and figure out 
how we can improve those metrics the next time that we do this right here. So that's considered uh, more quote unquote defined. Uh, when I was working for SED and on a, a couple of projects over there, we had a level four where it was quantitatively measured and controlled. Formal processes were in place to collect and an analyze the quantitative data, and then metrics were defined and then given to a process improvement program. So very, very difficult um, to achieve and probably even more difficult to maintain a level four. Uh, ben McGee's opinion right here, the two big projects that I have been on for um, multiple years for each one of them that were using uh, CMMI and um, were at a level four at one point, both of those projects struggled with maintaining that level four vetting and maintaining that uh, that moniker, if you will, for the, the certification for level four CMMI shop. Uh, ben McGee's opinion is uh, when you get to a level four, there are too many cooks in the kitchen. And this is just having been on two projects for about four years of my life. Um, what do I mean by that? Too many cooks in the kitchen? Uh, well, if you don't know, if you've never been in a scenario like that before, what I mean is uh, usually right here, it's about 75% management, 25% workers. So what does that mean to me? That means that there's too many chiefs and not enough Indians right here. And because of that, we typically see uh, micromanagement, micromanagement, and that does not foster creativity and innovation at all. So uh, very difficult to achieve this right here, uh, level four. I've never personally seen any company get to a level five. Um, and I've never seen a company get there and I've never seen a company stay at a level five. So I have no exper experience with that, but typically with a level five, what if you, if you read about it and you analyze, you do study and you're watching research on it, they focus on continuous improvement and it's built into the annual budget to become CMMM, CMMI certified level five. And this looks really, really good on contracts. So a lot of massive government contractors uh, tried to achieve the highest level of CMM, CMMI that they possibly can. So then they can put that as a positive discriminator on a contract that they may be submitting. And uh, it's quite interesting um, because it also, to you know, any of the government people that are on the horn here, uh, also adds a tremendous amount of overhead expense to that, right? This process isn't free, somebody's gotta pay for it. And so usually the billable rate per hour for projects that are implementing something like a CMMI, usually studies show that they are 10 to 20% higher the billable hourly rates are 10 to 20% higher if they have a level three or trying to reach a level four implementation of CMMI. That tells that should tell you um, about how much administrativia there is with this. There's a lot of a lot of meetings, a lot of uh, reports, a lot of quad charts. Um, it's it's based off of metrics, quantitative analysis. So a uh, tremendous amount of overhead. And a lot of times where I've seen this, I remember uh, visiting Sikorsky up in Stratford, Connecticut. And um, at each one of, they have massive warehouse 
where it's probably as big as a football field, maybe even two football fields. Um, and in that massive warehouse, they had uh, maybe, you know, 10 different um, assembly lines. And it, the helicopters would start with just the bare metal shell at the first uh, first stage of the assembly line or the first spot in the assembly line. And then uh, at each stage on the assembly line would have a huge monitor, like a you know, 72 inch monitor at in front of the stage where management could walk down each line of the assembly line and at each stage, they could see the, the metrics that adhered to the CMMI and specifically how long it was taking to do things at each stage of the process. So that way, you know, for those union workers up there, if something was supposed to take them uh, 160 hours to complete and it was taking them, you know, uh, 200 hours. What happened here? And you could immediately identify what happened. But also on the flip side, for those for those worker bees, if they were getting close to being complete with with something, they could do a gut check. And let's say that they were at 100 hours. It was supposed to take them 160 hours. What did we forget to do? Or in most cases, what ends up happening in reality is. How can we milk the clock to get to that 160 hours and then push that to the next phase? Not saying that always happens, but, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a quid pro quo back and forth where if it's a standard deviation one way, how can we bring that back to normalcy? Uh, same if it goes to a negative skew, how can we bring that back to not being a, an outlier anymore? And so those quantitative metrics are definitely very helpful for you to go through and uh, show specific tasks and measure processes and constantly try or continuously try to improve on those processes. But also, uh, in my experience, from the worker's perspective, it could, it can lead to a feeling of micromanagement which uh, typically will also really, uh, will, will lead to uh, resentment amongst the workers. And once you get that, that's hard to get rid of. So uh, this is interesting. And uh, if you've never heard about this before, you've never been involved with this, uh, hopefully one day you, you get a chance because uh, there is a lot of value to it, especially uh, the projects that, that I've been on that um, are you know, trying to get to a level three, you definitely see a lot of value with that. You know, they you start to get those repeatable and defined uh, processes, and it definitely helps with efficiency. Uh, so I think the, you know, trying to get up to here, level three, this leap right here, and, you know, going back and forth between this right here, this is a tremendous overhead right here, going between level three and level four, in my experience. Okay, so uh, the capability maturity model, the CMM, is uh, is what we see right here. So this is the model, CMM. The CMMI is the integration of the model. So you 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 know what the model is, and then now how do we we integrate that into the project. So you're practicing the CMM uh, if you are doing CMMI. Does that make sense? The integration is the I. Uh, 